We are delighted to present uh, Dr. Volker. So this presentation, I think, has uh, the total number of people that have registered for this is over 800. Uh, and that speaks a lot about uh, Ben. Um, so by looking at his uh, website, he, according to his own words, he wears multiple hats. He's a mathematical, statistical, and computational biologist. Um, he has a, a bachelor's in physics and mathematics from Yale and a PhD in zoology from Cambridge University. Currently, he's a professor in the Department of Math and Statistics and Biology at McMaster, and he's the director of the School of Computational Science and Engineering. So the things I would like to highlight about Ben is really, if you ever looked any, uh, any if you ever had any question regarding random effects, mixed models, and you looked it up in Stack Overflow, probably you've run across one of his answers. He has, 3,400 answers approximately Stack Overflow. Um, and he has been a co-developer uh, of many packages that many of us use. So LME4, JLMMTMB, BBMLE. And so these are packages that are have become the bread and butter for many of the analysis that we do. Um, so um, from a very personal perspective, I'm very happy to have been here because back in the day when he was teaching at UF, I think it was like 2007, I took a course with him. That's how I started getting to R, Bayesian Statistics, MLE. So uh, that, that makes this uh, particularly special. But anyway, without further ado, uh, Ben, the, the floor is yours. All right, thank you very much. It's an honor, it's a little scary. I said in a tweet last night that I have this many people in intro bio lectures, but I think mostly they're not paying attention. Um, and looking at the participant list, I see lots of people I know and hello everyone. Um, I am going to get started because I, of course, was ambitious about what I wanted to share with you. I tried to, uh, and I'm gonna be ignoring the chat and assume that Jody will let me know if something is actually burning. Um, I'm going to share my entire screen and I'm, so Jody, will you put the links in the uh, in the chat for people? Yep, yep I so will. So all the materials are here if you want to follow along. I want to start out by saying just a couple of quick overview things. This is intended to be about one third overview and two thirds uh, nitty gritty coding, but there's some conceptual stuff mixed in with the coding as well. This is an extremely heterogeneous audience, and I apologize in advance if you're either overwhelmed or bored, but I had to do that. I'm just doing the best I can, and you can, answer, you can ask super basic questions or super advanced questions, uh, and I'll try to answer them. So assuming that everybody can see this and that it's big enough, I'm going to start by just going over some foundations that, again, I hope most people have at least heard of, but if you haven't, this should get you on board. What I said, and I'll, I'll mention in the context of forecasting, that mixed models are not specifically a forecasting tool, but they're a pretty general, powerful framework, and you certainly can use them for forecasting. Um, so some highlights from what I said in the uh, overview that went on the website, they're an extension of linear and generalized linear models. They're dealing with observations that are measured within groups, which could be field sites, years, blocks, genotypes, species. I'll talk a little more about that. And you can think about them either as accounting for non-independence or correlation, you can think about them as a way to estimate variation among groups, or you can think about them as a way to estimate the effects of each group without using more statistical power than you need to. And they're most useful when you have a lot of groups, and especially when you have different amounts of data, different amounts of noise, or different numbers of observations in each group. So, People will talk about the random effect of years. And when they say that, they mean 
typically that the that year is the grouping variable, and that has to be a discrete categorical variable. And they often and implicitly there's something that varies across groups. In most mixed model packages in R, that this is notation invented by Doug Bates, that's denoted as F bar G, and it's read as the effect of F varies across the groups defined by G. If you're only interested in variation in the intercept or the baseline, then F is one, and we would call that an intercept only model. And what we're trying to do when we estimate the effects of F, so the effects in the example I'm going to give, the effects of increasing fire frequency for each biome, we're estimating the effects for each group, but we're shrinking them or pooling them towards the population average. Again, all of this is very quick. And if you've never heard of this, any of this stuff before, just hang on because I don't have time to do the, <laughs> I don't have time to do this properly. So hopefully, hopefully this is reminding you. Um, there's not a really hard and fast rule about this is a random effect or this is not a random effect. And I'll refer you to a couple of references. All of the references are at the end. Random effects don't let you calculate p-values for the difference of a particular group from another group or the difference of a particular group from the mean. They do give you an estimate of the value of that group. So for prediction management, that should be sufficient. They're, in, they're also interesting if, if you're an evolutionary biologist and you want to quantify the variation, for example, across species or across genotypes. They're handy because you can make predictions for new groups that weren't sampled in your data. They're handy because they share information across groups. They're useful when you have groups with not very much information. You don't have to throw them away. You can use those samples, but weight them according, they get automatically weighted according to the amount of information they contain. In the classical definition, the groups must be random, randomly sampled from some larger population. That's something that I don't, I don't feel as strongly about that part of defi a definition. You can also think about it when you have a variable that you're not interested in, that you're trying to control for, that's categorical, that comes in discrete groups. The groups are exchangeable, and this approach that I'm going to talk about works best when you have at least five or six groups and a small, it, it's fine if there's a small number, more at least one, but a small number, at least, yeah, an, an average of at least one, and it's useful when they're unbalanced groups. I'm going to be using LME4, which is probably the most widely used mixed model package in R, and I'm going to be using a, an extension called GAM4 that adds some generalized additive model machinery a little bit to deal with spatial autocorrelation. I have a real grab bag of, of which other tools from the R universe I use, so there will be a little bit of tidyverse stuff in here, but I'm not a I'm not a, a complete tidy converse. And I'll be using some additional packages and I'll try to notate functions that use those extended packages with the double colon. And I think this link is somewhere else as well. This is a Google sheet where I've started to, where I and other people have started to try to compile a big list of all the, of, of the R mixed model ecosystem. That's it for the science intro, for the stats intro. Here's the science intro. I've been gradually working on a paper for several years with Max Moritz and Enrique Batlori on where they, they got a hold of a big synthetic uh, global terrestrial data set on species richness, primary productivity, and fire. And I can I can answer specific questions later, but I'm gonna I'm gonna go over this pretty quickly. 
the middle row here is essentially our response variables. And in the paper, we're analyzing all three of these species richness patterns. I'm gonna focus in this example on the bird richness data because all three analyses really pretty much go in parallel. There's not, not that much extra except to, to be done when you're to learn about the methodology when you're doing all three of them. The predictor variables are the size. Okay, sorry. We have three different geographic scales that we're interested in. We have large scale, these are called floristic realms, and they're essentially kind of evolutionary units, biogeographic large scale units. Biomes, which as people here are ecologists, everybody should be familiar with, tropical forests, mangrove, desert and shrub, boreal forest, tundra, et cetera. The ecoregions are our sampling units. And these were essentially developed, these were developed by Olson et al in 2001, essentially as individual ecological units. And I can't really go into the definition very much more. There are about 700 of these. So they're smaller in scale than either the realms or the biomes. For the predictor variables we're interested, we included the size of the ecoregion um, because that obviously has an effect on species diversity, although that's not our primary interest. We're interested in the mean, the annual grams per of carbon per meter squared of net primary productivity and the, inter the coefficient of variation, the interannual variability of NPP. We're also interested in and this is kind of what's new about this analysis, the fraction of NPP eaten, consumed, I'm gonna use fire eaten later on, by NPP on average and the interannual variability of that fire consumption variable. Okay, I think that's everything I have to say about the data. So we're going to try to estimate the effects of NPP fire consumption these interannual variabilities, this is uh, coefficient of variation, and they're all the two-way interactions on species richness. But we're gonna try to account for variability in those effects across realms, across biomes, and across biomes within realms. So that's why we need mixed models. We have large scale, discrete grouping variable. We have medium scale discrete variable, uh, discrete grouping variable. We're also going to include the biome by realm interaction, which instead of being tropical grasslands or neotropics is tropical grasslands in the neotropics. And then the ecoregion is the sampling unit. I want to talk briefly, I want to take a breath. I want to talk briefly about a conceptual issue which comes up, which is nesting and crossing of random effects. Realm and biome are what we would consider cross random effects. There's more than one tropical grassland, uh, sorry, there's more than one realm, there's more than one biome, and each biome can occur in each realm. To go back to a kind of non-ecological example, a nested random effect would be one where class, if we have classes within schools, class one in school one is just a label. It doesn't have anything to do with class one in school two. So class one with each of these subunits is a separate subunit that doesn't share anything with the other uh, units with the same label. If we have crossed random effects, uh, Tropical forest in the neotropics has something in common with tropical forests in other realms. So in this case, the biomes and the realms are crossed. And that's what gets us our, our biome by realm level. Uh, if you, I'm gonna skip that, not as important. A little bit more terminology. I'm almost done with the overview and I'm not horribly behind schedule yet, so that's wonderful. 
when people say a random effect, if, if somebody just said, comes into your office and says, oh, I ran a model with a random effect of species, what they usually mean is that they're considering the variation in the intercept across species. If I said, if I said a random effect of biome, I would typically mean that the average species richness varies across biomes. This is actually a very special case of random effects. Most random effects and arguably more random effects ought to be random slopes models, models that consider the variation of an ecological effect across the levels of the grouping variable. When we have more than one parameter in that term, however, so we're going to fit a model eventually that allows the intercept and all four of the main effects to vary across biomes or across realms. That's going to mean that we need to estimate, for example, the variation in the effect of fire and the variation in the effect of interannual variability in fire and all of the and the correlation between those two effects, which means that when we have four effects and an intercept, we're going to end up having to estimate 15 parameters. If we cut that down and we assume that that biomes with that are especially fire sensitive are not also especially sensitive to NPP, then we, we could choose to assume that the random effects were all independent of each other, which would cut the number of parameters down to five. Going to work with basically every, most of our variables are going to be, the, sorry, the NPP and fire variables are going to be log scaled. The coefficients of variation are all essentially unitless already because they're proportions. We're going to center everything. This is going to make everything easier and it's going to avoid us screwing up. This is the probably on my top 10 tell people to read it paper. It's just explaining why you should scale and center your variables. And because these are going to be log law, we're going to estimate effects of log things on log species richnesses, the coefficients are going to be interpretable as elasticities. I want to finish with a couple of cartoons or, or schematics from a couple. This is from Gelman and Hill's book on regression modeling, showing that you have simple models that are easy but don't do what you want, complex models that you want that break or don't work. And there's a similar, there's a similar picture from Uriarte and Yakulik showing that we have simple models that are definitely wrong, although if you if you have good eyes, you can see, they say, how likely is it that the model is wrong and it's certain on both sides, which I like. But we're going from a simple model to a complex model, and we're basically trying to get as far to the right as we can. We're trying to fit the model that makes us happiest as ecologists that doesn't overfit too much or break the machinery. Okay. Uh, Jody, any urgent questions so far? Nope, you're doing just fine. Okay. So I apologize for not doing this in our studio, but uh, that's too big. Oop, that's still too big. That's way too big. Hang on, hang on. Of course we have technical difficulties. We'll do not adjust your sound. All right, so I'm now, this is the R markdown file that I've been presenting from, and I'm going to just zoom down here. These are all the notes you had, all the notes I showed you. I'm going to zoom down here until I get to the actual code. And uh, I have, well, and I'm going to start by just dumping in all bunch of packages. I'm trying to illustrate best practices here, um, like annotating what I'm using the packages for and putting all the packages up front so that I, when my code breaks, I know because I don't have a package, I know that right away. I'm grabbing the data here. Um, Jody, should I make the, the console, uh, is console viewable or should I make it one larger? 
Try one larger. Let's see what it looks like. Yeah, that's probably good. So there's probably a bunch of stuff that I don't need in here, but it includes the bird log diversity, which is going to be my response variable. And it includes scaled logged versions or scaled versions of the coefficients of variation. F eat is fire eaten. And I also have the biome and the realms and the biome interacting with the floristic realms. Um, so this starting from the left side of the diagram, I'm going to um, fit a model using pretty much the standard R syntax for the fixed effects. I forgot to scale and log the area up front, so I'm including that. And I'm only including an intercept, a, a variation in the intercept across biomes. So that's the expected, uh, that's the mean log species diversity at the average values of all the predictors. And the squared here is putting in all the pairwise interactions of these variables. That's not too bad. That's quick anyway, and it didn't complain at me. It's best to check your diagnostics as early as you can, because when you look at diagnostics, you see things, you want to look at the diagnostics before you get a look at the p-values and the confidence intervals so that you don't say, oh, I really like that model. Let's hope I can keep it. Um, this, is this, this is what you get if you do plot on a on um, on LME LMER model, and it's just plotting fitted against residuals. And I hope that this is flat, and there's a smoothing line here, and that doesn't look too bad. Unlike linear models, if I want to plot something like a scale location plot, which is the square of the absolute value of the residuals against the fitted, I have to do it myself. It's not quite as easy. And there might be a little bit of a tendency for decreasing variance at higher values of the fitted value, but that's not, this isn't something that I'm going to, that's going to worry me a lot. And I'm going to look at the influence plot from the car package, which is giving me the leverage, the potential influence of a residual on the X axis and the size of the residual on the Y axis. And the bubbles here are Cook's distance, which is essentially the product of the residuals and the hat values. I apologize. I think the labels on the plots are quite small, but there's nothing I can do about that in a hurry. So I'll try to tell you what's on the axes. And potentially interesting points are numbered. And it also prints out the residuals and the hat value and the Cook's distance for values above a threshold. This is uh, the largest one of these is uh, the largest of these is Cook's distance is 0 0.1. 0 0.5 is a typical rule of thumb for um, when you should worry about a Cook's distance. I'm going to come back in a little bit and talk about Dharma, which is a newer, fancier way of plotting the residuals, particularly effective when you're dealing with binary data. but um, it shows a QQ plot, so an, an estimate of the goodness of fit of the distribution of the residuals. And on the right-hand side, it's showing a predicted versus residuals plot, except that it's scaled. It's different because it's scaled so that the predictions go from zero to one and the residuals go from zero to one. This is supposed to be a uniform, these points are supposed to be uniformly distributed in this plane. The lines are quantile regressions. So this is the median, the middle line is the median of the residuals and the outer lines are the 25th and 75th quartiles of the residual, of quantiles of the residuals. This looks alarming. I will come back later. I shouldn't really be looking at the at the diagnostics yet anyway, because this model is supposed to be just something that I'm trying to see if something really simple works. So I'm not going to worry about that too much at the moment. 
If we want to plot coefficient plots, which again, I shouldn't be doing yet, um, this is showing me, again, the labels are too small, but this is showing me all of the coefficients and their estimated values and their 95% confidence intervals. And I would say this is actually a much better way to look at things than the summary, which, which in, uh, help encourages you to stare at the stars on the p-value column. So this gets, because I've scaled all my predictors, this, get, this tells me about the magnitudes. You can't see this, but that's NPP. So that's got a very large, that's larger than everything else. That's not a big surprise. It does look like preliminarily, we might have some significant effects here. Um, actually, let me try. Uh, that's a little better. Can I, should I bump it up one more? Probably. Much better. Um, I, I, I have to, yeah. Um, this is the same plot, except that I've, I've used a utility function that I defined in the utils.r that I posted to just sort the effects by magnitude. Well, not by magnitude, but I mean, they're going positive to negative. There's an argument for showing the absolute values here, but then it gets confusing. But now we can more clearly pick out that NPP is the big thing. Fire seems to have a, a is the next str strongest effect. And then we get interannual variability of NPP. And then we start getting all the two-way interactions. Okay. That's all too easy. So I'm going to take the model instead of a random inter, I'm going to subtract. So this is, this might be, this is the update function, which I really love, which says, okay, drop the, drop the one by biome random effect you had here. And instead add variation across biomes in all four of the main effects and the intercept. Um, and that takes noticeably long. That takes, and it's warning me about a singular fit. So good, things are getting nice and complicated. Um, I'll come back to that in a minute. The nice thing about update is that you don't have, you, you get to see just what changes. That can be a problem if you have a really long list of models, you might forget what was in your base model. But in general, this reduces the amount of code and makes it easier to see what's going on. I think I need to speed up a little bit. DW plot is also really great for comparing fits of models. I'm only looking at the fixed effects here. I'm not looking at the variance across biomes, but just looking at the fixed effects, I can see that this didn't, adding in the random slopes didn't make a huge difference. Things bounced around, things that were significant before aren't significant. But if you're not, if you're not obsessed with p-values, you can say this is giving me approximately the same message that I had before. Okay. The maximal model, which I thought I wanted to mention, the maximal model is the model that includes all of the effects that you could possibly measure variation. So it's all, and this is gonna take about 30 seconds. So I'll set it going while I talk about it. So it's essentially every, every term in the fixed effects, every, every predictor you have where you've measured different values of that predictor in each group. So I can measure the variation in the effect of fire across groups because I have across biomes because I have multiple eco regions in each biome and each well that was faster than I thought each biome has a different uh, fire consumption variable so those are all identifiable this is not actually the 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 maximal model because the maximal model would also include all of the two way interactions but that would be a little bit crazy. Going over this though, 
I've I have and unfortunately the formula syntax doesn't let me compact this quite as much as I should as I'd like to but I have all four of those effects and the intercept is included by by default varying across all three of my uh geographic scales and what you're going to see so I can ask I have a utility function that says is that singular singular means a variance is estimated as zero or a correlation is estimated as plus one or minus one or in a little bit of brain explosion if you have a five-dimensional random variable it might have collapsed to three dimensions so i i might have i'm trying to estimate a five by five covariance matrix but there's really only, I can only have the data to estimate three independent dimensions and the other two collapse to zero. And it can be quite tricky um, when you, so this is, this is the, the variance covariance structure that was estimated for that model. So for each group, I have the grouping variable, I have each of the effects, I have the standard deviation of each effect, and then I have the correlations among every pair of effects. So there's 45 parameters here. That sounds like a bad idea. You can see that the correlations are very large. There's only one of them that's actually listed as minus one. None of these standard deviations are zero, but it's very easy in these large scale models you can get a model where all the standard deviations are positive and all the correlations are between plus and minus one. But because it's a 17 dimensional thing collapsed to 12 dimensions, you can't look at it and see. And that's why you need this criterion. And I could get into more technical details if people want. So the maximal model, the idea I explained, I should have explained this a little bit before, it usually doesn't work because it's usually too complicated for the data you have. It can also sometimes not work. If I have a, an example that I that I link to here, we had there are nest boxes that are measured in two different seasons. And if I in a linear model, if I include an up, uh, if I try to estimate the if the I say, well, I have I measure each nest box in both seasons, so I should be able to estimate that variability in that effect. But because there's only one measurement of each nest box of each nest box in each season, that turns out to be confounded with the residual variance. There are as many random effect values as there are residuals. Okay, what do we do about this? There's a big argument about how you should try to deal with models that are too complicated. And they basically boil down to two schools of thought. One is that you should make the model as complicated. If, if you don't run into any technical problems, if there's no singularity, no convergence warnings, everything looks wonderful, then I would argue you should use the maximal model. Um, Barr et al and Shilzeth say, take your maximal model and throw stuff away until it at least works computationally. Bates and Vasis and Matushek and other people say, no, you should use a data-driven approach, essentially do some kind of stepwise or some kind of model selection to get, don't do the selection on the fixed effects, but select among the possible random effects and see what is the best model. Very briefly, Singularity and lack of convergence are different things. Singularity means you have a zero variance lurking in there somewhere. Convergence warning means the computer thinks there might be something wrong. You know, it, it, it tried to estimate the gradient or the second derivatives at the optimum and things look a little bit funky and maybe there's something wrong. Um, there's a very sad story to tell you over beer, but there are lots of false positives from the convergence warnings. And the gold standard is to run your model with a bunch of different optimizers and see whether different numerical methods all give you answers that are close enough, uh, 
and close enough is a is a subjective what aspect of the model are you interested in question once you run you say i ran all these different optimizers even though some of them are giving them me convergence warnings i'm basically getting the, the same story i'm interested in from all of the different optimizers so i'm going to ignore the convergence warnings and go ahead there are 27 possible combinations oh, right I could try to fit the full, I could try to fit the full five by five covariance matrix. I could try to fit 15 parameters for each of the three levels. And I just showed you that that doesn't work very well. I could assume that they're all independent, which means I only have to estimate five parameters, the variability and diversity, variability in the effect of fire, variability in the effect of NPP and so forth. Or I could just say, screw it, I can't estimate every anything. I'm just going to estimate, I'm going to use an intercept only model. So I have three possible models, each of which could apply at three possible at, at the each of the geographic levels I'm interested in, at the biome, the realm, and the biome by realm interaction. So I have 27 models to look at. Generally, I I don't like fitting a whole bunch of models and seeing which one is best there are ways around this but they're much more complicated so this is some overly complicated code that i'm going to just talk about briefly what it's doing is constructing a formula it's taking it's either constructing a formula with a one in it a formula with these variables separated by a single bar, which means we're looking at a correlated model, or all of these variables separated from the grouping variable by a double bar, which means they're, they're independent of each other. And I'm squashing those all into a data frame. So I'll just show you what the, what the first, uh, I hate it when that happens, excuse me. Oh, good. Perfect. We will, we will be back in a moment. So I'm going to just show you briefly what the, the first row of that data set is the simplest model, one by biome, one by realms, one by interaction. The last row of that uh, data set well, you can't even see it, but it's the complicated case for all three of them. So there's 27 rows in that in that uh, data frame. And now I'm going to run through and run the model basically for every row in that data set. The whole thing takes about 10 minutes to run on this reasonably fast machine. So I'm going to cheat and read in the pre-computed set of 27 models. I'm going to look at the AIC for each model. I'm going to see whether each model is singular or not. And I'm going to see whether each model has any warnings. The has warning is in the utilities file. And this is what the whole thing looks like. Which model it is, what the AIC is, whether or not it's a singular fit, whether or not I have convergence warnings, speeding up a little bit. I'm going to find the best model. The best model is turns out to be number 19. And hmm. oh, let me just make sure I got the right one there. Sorry about that, folks. Huh. Well, we'll see what happens. Oh, no, that's right. Sorry, I just misremembered. It has intercept. I could look at this again. This is the summary. No, this is just, yes, this is the printout. This has independent effects at the biome realm interaction level and, an, sorry, independent values at this level and intercepts only at the biome and floristic realm level. Whew. Some quick diagnostics. These are going to be small again. There's my fitted versus residual. There's my scale location plot. It doesn't look very different. 
There's my influence plot, nothing terribly alarming. There are some larger Cook's distances here. And this is what Dharma says. So I still, the, the fit of the distribution looks good, but that's actually not something I care about a huge amount. But it looks like I've got a problem with bias. I'm going to claim that that's a false positive, that that's actually not something I need to worry about because, um, okay, sorry. I'm going to plot this. This is plotting against the, the fitted values. I'm going to plot this. If I plot it against NPP instead, um, I still have a problem. So I still have what, so this is NPP on the X axis and residuals on the Y axis and quantile regressions are the lines. And this looks like I've got a big problem. Dharma computes the residuals ignoring the random effect component. And that's a good default because in a lot of cases, the random effects can lead to artifacts in the residuals that make you all worried for, for not a good reason. But I'm going to argue, I'm going to show you some complicated code, but I'm basically just going to show you the picture here. So this is on the left-hand side, these are residuals plotted without including any of the, without including any of the random effects. Um, NPP on the x-axis, residuals on the y-axis. These are now regular residuals, not residuals scaled between zero and one. So the pattern's not quite the same, but we, and this is the, the low S fit. So, but we've clearly, if I were looking at this, I would say we've clearly got a problem. These are the residuals taking the, taking the random effects into account and most of the problem goes away. So this is basically saying that we're under predicting some hot spots and we're under predicting some cold spots, but once we include the among biome and among biome by realm variation, we're actually accounting for that. Okay, I am actually almost done. So I think, I think that's mostly a model I'm comfortable with. The, the last thing that I want to check is um, geographic is spatial autocorrelation. So I'm getting, I'm extracting the residuals and I'm doing a plot of the residuals with positive residuals in blue and negative residuals in red and the size and the intensity both increasing with the amount of the residuals. You should please ignore that big red data point there. I actually recently, very recently, I think I might want to get rid of that. The, the salient point here, these are the residuals, and there is clearly spatial pattern left here. I am clearly over predicting in a bunch of the neotropical rainforest and under predicting in most of uh, the southern neotropics and under predicting in Central America, even though I've taken the realms and the biomes and the biomes by realms into account. So I need, then there are, there are fancier, more formal ways to do this. I'm switching to the GAM4 package. GAM4 is basically LME4, but you can stick in the various smooth functions that the MGCV package provides. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, I'm sorry. Um, Remarkably, this is a little bit of a pain because these values, if I want to fit a spatial model to these values, I have to account for the fact I have to do something about projection and the fact that I've got data like all over a sphere and these points are actually, the, the Kamchatka is actually close to Alaska, even though it doesn't look like it on this picture. GAM4 allows me to add a spherical smooth to my model. So I'm taking the formula that I had and adding a spherical smooth to it and fitting the model. And that's actually going to take a little while. I'm not, well, I'm now I'm stuck with it. I will show you that that doesn't, 
uh, that that doesn't make a big, a huge difference in my conclusions, but it's nice to have taken care of it. Um, this is the comparison dot whisker plot between GAM4 and LME4. Didn't make a huge difference. GAM4 is kind of a pain to work with. The utilities that I included here actually make it a little bit easier to work with. Um, and I'm going to switch back to the pictures uh, for the last few minutes, just to accelerate slightly. Um, so this is the coefficient plot that we put in the paper which is basically the same thing that you were looking at with nicer labels and a different order and showing the results for all three taxa. You can compute R squared values and there's a package um, which I've hacked a little bit, um, <laughs> which will do this, which will compute the R squared of the model and the partial R squareds for each term. There are double dangerous bends in here to indicate that there are some that there's some kind of funny things. R squares are very hard for mixed models, and I'm not actually absolutely comfortable, but roughly speaking, they mirror the absolute values of the coefficient value. So NPP is the biggest, fire is the next biggest area, which was a negative value, is now a positive R squared, and it's the next largest effect. This is what the paper says when we look at it for all three taxa. Um, EM means and effects and GG effects. There's a predict method for these models, but it definitely makes it easier to get the predictions if you use one of these add-on packages. So I'm constructing a vector of the NPPs from min to max by 51, and then I'm asking EM means to extract the predictions and plotting the points and the predictions. Um, there's also a package on GitHub for getting the partial residuals, which is basically subtract this plot, and I really will be done in one minute, I think. This plot shows NPP on the x-axis, log NPP, and predicted log bird diversity or observed log bird diversity. But the variability in this point cloud includes all the variability in all the other predictors that we're just squashing into two dimensions now. So arguably, it looks a little bit worse than it should. The partial residuals are taking the predicted values for each data point of all of the non-focal predictors and, and subtracting them. So this is, in principle, the variation, if my model is OK, it's the variation only due to NPP and residual variation. Uh, I haven't looked at random effects very much here because that wasn't the primary goal um, for this model. Um, the random effects at the biome realm region, we have one for every biome realm combination. And we have one for, so this is all of the variability of the effect of the interannual variability on NPP in a particular biome functional uh, realm combination. For the biome, for the biome level and the realms level, we only have an intercept, so it's a lot easier to look at. We would have liked to look at the we would have liked to dissect this variation a lot more and look at the across biome variation in the effect of fire. But honestly, even though this is a very big, painstakingly synthesized data set, it's not really big enough. We don't really have a lot of signal left at the level of these to examine. We're mostly using the random effects as a, as a statistical independence term not to explore the relationships. I will take questions now. All right, thank you, Ben. Um, so 
so I'm looking at the uh, um, the link that polev.com fi 2021, and I'm ordering the questions according to the ones that were most upvoted. So the first one um, is: Is it valid to use AICC or other information criterion uh, to choose between allowing variation of intercept only versus allowing also allowing slopes to vary? Um. I, I don't think anybody really knows. I don't think any, I'm not aware that anybody's really evaluated that carefully. Um, I would say there are two issues. One issue is that we actually already know that the AIC is a little bit suspect for this case because the AIC, the derivation of the AIC assumes that the models are all in the middle of their parameter space and none of the models that that variation sorry that none of the models are at the edge of the of the overall parameter space where the overall parameter space is the variance covariance space and you can't have a variance less than 0 so some of the models with zero variances in them are not technically um are not technically valid even for doing AIC comparisons. In general, for p-values, that tends to make AIC a little bit conservative. So it's likely to make to say that that these extra values are not necessary. So you would perhaps throw them away unnecessarily. I guess what I'm worried about with AICC is that if you're if you're is that you're kind of stacking issues, we don't really know how well AICC works for nonlinear, for GLMs. We're not really, AICC was derived for simple linear models. So that, sorry, I'm not being very clear here. I think it should be valid, but if you're dealing with a data set that's small enough that you need AICC, then I'm, I'm a little bit worried. It would it would tend to make you more conservative, and I'm not sure. And that might make you very conservative, and I might worry about being that conservative. That was a long, not really clear answer. Next, um, can you uh, just elaborate a little bit more on that and say then how to determine uh, if you should choose a model that has a variation of intercepts only versus allowing slopes to vary. Right. So bar et al. don't think you should. Bar et al. think you should use the most complicated model that, that works, that computes adequately and isn't singular. Matushek et al. do some simulations with a, I think a p-value cutoff of 0.1 or 0.2. So they use a kind of loose uh, p-value criterion. I did when I was when I was doing this uh, analysis, and I don't know that I can pull it up immediately. I think you do, in any case, want to check that you that your selection of, if you can, that your selection of random variables isn't making a huge difference. I'm going to share my screen for a second. Uh, which is, this is part of the bigger, co more complicated, messy workflow that I did for the whole project. These are the, the fixed effects for all 27 models, showing which ones are singular and not singular, and showing the variability of the fixed effect across all of these. Um, so, I mean, I think I would, you know, I would hesitantly use AIC to select these things. Um, and I might use AIC precisely because it's the least conservative of AIC, BIC, and AICC. And therefore, it's going to lead you to include the random effects in your model when they're on the edge which I think is actually a good idea. 
Fantastic. All right. Um, the other question. Um, what are your thoughts on the pros and cons of fitting these types of models in a Bayesian versus a maximum likelihood framework? That's that's a, a simple question with a short answer. No. Um, I think the Bayesian models are, I think if, if I could snap my fingers and fit a Bayesian model at the same, with the same speed, convenience, and simplicity as fitting a frequentist model, I would generally go with the Bayesian model all the time. Um, I have in my extras of my slides, I said Bayesian approach is slower, but you get more. So it might take 10 or 20 or 100 times longer to fit the model but it makes it easy to regularize. So it makes it easy. It avoids the, it avoids the which random effects am I going to put in? You put them all in, you put an appropriately regularized, you put a strong enough prior on all of them that it's sensible and you don't run into the boundaries and you don't get zeros and you don't get bad stuff happening. It's nice to be able to include informative priors and they handle uncertainty better. Most of the, the, the confidence intervals that I showed you in the predictive plots are don't account for the uncertainty in the random effect component of the model. Um, so they're probably a little bit too narrow. And the only way around that in the frequentist case is parametric bootstrapping, which is really slow. Um, so yeah. Great. Um, another question here is, what are the best practices for when you have covariates that are measured at different scales? For example, uh, you could have some predictors that are measured at the biome level and some that are measured at the uh, ecoregion level. What's really nice about these models is that you can pretty much, that's not really something you have to worry about. You can pretty much toss in the predictors, allow for variability at whatever levels are appropriate and identifiable, and the model structure will take care of it. And by the way, if I'm saying something that's absolute garbage, I'm hoping Dennis will stop me. So uh, no garbage. I haven't heard anything. <laughs> but um, so the question here is, Every time I apply the mixed effects model, I receive the is singular comment. And, but, but how do I cope with a singular fit? So you have, unfortunately you have lots of choices. Um, the, the model with a singular fit is probably overfitted, is probably too complicated, might be lowering your power. But as far as we know, it's actually a well-posed statistical answer. It just has some of the variances set to zero. Um, so, and I guess I would clarify, if this is an intercept only model, if you've already simplified the random effect as much as you can. So if you haven't simplified the model, if you're trying to fit a five by five covariance matrix, then try making it diagonal, try making it intercept only. I mentioned in my, uh, in my, in my extras, there's, a, there's an option called compound symmetry where you could assume that all the correlations are the same, all the pairwise correlations are the same. That's another way to simplify it. And uh, Maeve McGillicuddy in, uh, New South Wales is working on, so there's other ways to simplify, but let's get back to assuming you have an intercept only model. You can simply say, hey, there's, you know, I, I, this is not the best estimate of this variance is zero. And if that was the last random effect in my model, then I guess I'm gonna fit a generalized, I'm gonna fit a linear model or a generalized linear model. I don't, I've estimated the among group variance as zero, and so leaving out of my leaving it out of my model, leaving it out of my model is basically gonna, gonna get me the same answer as leaving it in my model and having LME4 yell at me that it's singular. 
you could also regularize. So there's a package called BLME, which is a Bayesian overlay, and this is in the extras as well, which basically adds the weakest possible regularizing prior. It adds a prior to the variance terms that prevents them from being estimated as exactly zero. Um, and you can go forward with that. It's a little bit of, a, of, a, of an inferential no man's land because you're regularizing the model, but you're estimating the most likely, you're, you're not estimating a mean as you normally would in Bayesian statistics. You're not sampling, it's just doing an optimization. So it's, it's a possibility. I would be tempted to, if, it's, if you got one intercept level random effect in your model and it's singular, I would carefully explain to the reviewers that that variability was estimated as zero, so I'm taking it out of the model. Great. Um, there are some questions also regarding how you, you scale the- Sorry, the, the, the statistician's answer would be, well, I guess you better get some better data then. Sorry, questions. No. Yeah, 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 no, that's fine. Um, so there's a question regarding how you scaled your variables. So um, it seems like you log scaled some of the variables, but what about other types of scaling? For instance, the question asks uh, Z-score scaling for the NPP data. Right, we actually did both. So I actually took the log and then, and, and so we went back and forth and we tried a couple of different things. And I will, I will comment that it, none of this affects, well, nonlinear transformations certainly affect the, the fit of the model. Fitting on the log scale or the linear scale are asking different questions. Centering and scaling, so Z scaling or centering alone, change the parameter estimates and the interpretation of the parameters, but they don't change the predictions. They don't change the overall fit. What we actually did was log transform NPP and fire, not log transform the coefficients of variation because they're essentially already unitless. They're already ratios of standard deviations to means. And then we centered everything and scaled everything. But there's an argument about whether you, in, in the presentation of the coefficients, we actually removed the scaling because we wanted them to be interpretable as elasticities. It's a little tricky. The default is Z, Z scaling is, is sort of always a, a good idea. But if you've thought about the default carefully and decided that you don't want to use the default, go for it. So, so essentially you did the z-score even after taking the logs, right? So you yes. first took the log and then you use z-score. So and the problem is that makes it a, so what is this variable? Well, this variable is the deviation around the geometric mean measured in units of one standard deviation of the log. Okay, that's nice. The only point is that we can then put them on, we can then compare the coefficients directly and that's a measurement of magnitude. The reason we decided in the paper to unscale them when presenting the coefficients is that we're also presenting the R squared values, which are essentially a measure, a unitless measure of magnitude. And there's actually, if we were doing, sorry, I'll say one more thing and then we can get on to the next question. If we were doing, and Shields' 2010 paper says this very nicely, if we were fitting regular old lin linear models, then the squared, uh, the squared z-scored parameter applied to the z-scored predictor would be exactly the partial r squared. But it's an, it's mixed, so the r squared is a more complicated. Fantastic. Um, there is apparent, apparently a lot of interest regarding <laughs> uh, your comment uh, that we 
um, we should be careful or we should not test differences between groups using mixed effects models. So I think the question is really wanting you to expand on why that would be the case. Sure. So this gets back to, to sort of proper, proper statistical philosophy, which I don't really do. So, so but I'll, I'll, I'll give you my understanding. The reason that we can get away, so when we, when we estimate the random effect, so I'm talking about something like the variation in the effect of fire across ecosystems, we are not, we're treating that variation as a random variable. In the, in the frequentist world, there's a difference between a parameter and a random variable. And a parameter is a thing that has a true value and a random variable is a thing that has a distribution. So when Doug Bates talks about the random effects, he likes to call them the conditional modes of the distribution of this effect. Meaning this is a random variable, but given the parameters I've estimated and given the data I've seen, that conditional distribution moves to look like the data and we can estimate a conditional mean and a conditional standard deviation but those things don't have the same inferential properties as a proper frequentist parameter and a proper frequentist estimate which has a sampling distribution and a bunch of stuff we could prove things about in the bayesian world this is another thing that's nice about the Bayesian world. In the Bayesian world, a parameter is a parameter is a parameter, and either it has a hyperparameter or not. So if we wanted to test statistical differences between groups, we could do that. But now the Bayesians don't like p-values, so you're back, you're kind of back where you started. I want to share my screen for one more second to make one more conceptual point which is that I don't, I think people are way more concerned than they should be about testing, you know, who cares that, let's say I, let's say I take these standard deviations, these 95% distributions of the conditional, 95% intervals of the conditional distributions. And I say, oh, well, tropical, subtropical moist forest is significantly different from the average all, of all biomes, but tropical grasslands aren't. I don't think that's a very interesting, this is purely opinion, but I, I, I would question, I would wanna have a conversation with you about why you would want to know that one particular group was significantly different from another particular group. You might have a good reason, but you might not. I know the, my supervisor told me to. That's the best reason, really. Yeah, uh, I think there there are a couple of questions that were actually focused on on that topic of how to test difference between groups and and all that. And I mean, another way to put it is is that there's no what what estimating random effects as a random effect means you get to pretend that you're only estimating one parameter instead of estimating 14 para instead of estimating a parameter for every level so you're estimating a variance for a, for an intercept level for an intercept random effect there's one parameter one top level parameter in the model which is the variance and you don't the all the values of the individual groups don't count against your parameter count and the the no free lunch what that costs is that you can't do inferences, you can't make inferences about differences among the groups. Great. Um, so another question here has to do with the R squared values, the marginal huh. and conditional. Um, what are the arguments against this? Your double band road signs. Are there any useful alternatives that can be presented to a approximate goodness of fit for mixed models. So I think the conditional and the conditional and marginal random effects actually are not bad. Um, and 
they're generally only weird when you're in one of those overfitted model trying pushing the data too hard situations. So in general, I think the the conditional and marginal effects are are pretty reasonable, and I I would never argue about them. The double dangerous bends here um, are have more to do with the partial R squared values, which I computed, which are not included in the standard Nakagawa, Shieldseth, Johnson, left check, et cetera, um, conditional and marginal R squared framework. I'm computing an R squared for each parameter, um, for, for each effect. And that's done with, I think I didn't include the reference, but there are, there's a series of papers by, I think Byron Edwards and Jaeger and others, where they come up with some, um, they come up with some other frame, some frameworks. They're very nice papers for, um, and I can try to post them in the chat or send them along later. Um, they come up with frameworks for estimating partial R squareds. And there are a few different ways to do it. And when I used the way that I thought looked most appropriate, I got a total model R squared that was smaller than the R squared for, in, for one of the parameters. And I actually talked to the author and he said, yeah, when I do, I see that happening sometimes too. I'm not quite sure I understand why that happens. And so I backed off to a different method, which gives me more sensible answers, but that may explain a little bit why I'm, why I'm expressing caution about using these. All right, um, there's a question here. Uh, if, if, if it makes sense, if we regress the conditional modes of random terms with another variable uh, about G. So for example, if you have a, random intercepts that varies uh, from species to species and regressing that intercept as a function of say species traits. That's generally a bad idea. Um, there's, a, there's papers by I think Jared Hadfield and other people. So the, the conditional modes more traditionally go by the jargon of BLUP, which is best linear unbiased predictor but Doug Bates doesn't like it because in the GLMM framework, they're not linear and they're not unbiased and they might not be best. So uh, he likes to call them conditional modes, but for searching the literature there, I th again, I think Hadfield's paper is, pr is probably the one I would find. And I'm sure that there's a reference. Well, I'm not sure that there's a reference to this in the GlimFAQ. That's generally dicey. I would, try, I, I, I can't say off the top of my head, but generally, if you can incorporate the question you're interested in, the relationship you're interested in as part of the model, um, yeah, I, I have, I'm, my answer is, I can see the question you're asking. I know that there are pitfalls in taking the conditional modes or blups as input variables for another analysis. And I'm not quite sure how to answer, to address the question that this person wants to address. So, so is it your, your comment that perhaps ideally the person would include the uh, species traits directly into the first model rather than- Yes, but uh, I'm, not, sort of I'm not sure. Uh, yes, but I'm not sure if that would if that would answer, if, if, if they would get an answer to the question they want. So there's a American Naturalist 2010, Hadfield is the first author, and the, art, the, the uh, title is The Misuse of Blup in Ecology and Evolution. And I don't remember the details, but that's where I would start. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm looking here, is it valid to use mean separation using E means with GLMER in LME4. 
Uh, repeat the question, which I probably still won't understand, but I'll try again. Yeah, it just says uh, if it's valid to use mean separation using uh, EM means uh, within uh, Glomer in LME4. So I I will I will I will take a guess at what the question means. So EM means so if if by mean separation you're saying something about let me take the predicted values for some pair of means and see whether they're significantly different from each other or not. EM means is reliable for for G, for GLMMs with a well a couple of caveats. One is that EM means in general uncertainties ignore the uncertainty in the in the estimates of the variance like i've said before about our about the predictive ribbons that i was drawing so it probably underestimates the residuals slightly uh and i was going to talk about bias correction but that's not actually relevant other than that the linear the underlying linear machinery of G, of glmms is sufficiently the same as that of LMMs that you can probably that that doing that comparison those comparisons will probably work. But I'm not the caveat there is I'm not absolutely sure what mean separation means in this context. So I might have answered the wrong question. No problem. Um, uh, another question here, and, and I think this is going to be our last question because we are almost uh, at the top of the um, almost 130. Um, should you always take coefficients from the full model or use model averaging via AIC or from the best model estimated by model selection? What a big can of worms. Um, sorry. If you're predicting and you don't care about your confidence intervals being a little bit too narrow, then model averaging is a good idea. If you actually want to estimate effect sizes and do inference and calculate p values, then you should always, then you, in my opinion, you should always use basically the, the biggest model that works or the a, AIC selected model. You, I, I think you should never do selection on the focal parameters. So like if you're interested in the fixed effects, doing selection on which fixed effects to include and then calculate and then using those coefficients. So model averaging or some other form of regularized estimation, if you're trying to do prediction and you don't care about good uncertainty estimates and the full model otherwise. Mm -hmm. Great. All right. So um, I think that was great. Uh, thank you, Ben, for agreeing to present. And thanks, everybody, for participating um, on the event. Um, I would just like to make a, a final comment that um, this is a seminar series, so we're going to have uh, additional presenters. Um, so we hope um, you can join on the um, seminars that we're going to have. The next one is on December 6th at 9 a.m. because our presenter is coming from Australia. Um, and he's going to be talking about species archetype models and regions of common profile models. So thank you all. And thanks again, Ben. That was really great. Thank you. I talked fast enough, right? Yeah, uh, it went well. Goodbye. Well, goodbye to everybody. Uh, hello and goodbye to the people I know. <laughs> Enjoy your afternoon or evening or where, whatever it is where you are. All right. Bye-bye.